later well. on. Yes, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Kenny, for um, organising today and, and having such a great uh, series of talks. So as I said, I often show slides that have things with fur on them. Um, and the point of this slide is to say that we have such a fabulous diversity of um, mammals in Australia, including monotremes and placental mammals and marsupials as well. And so I guess as um, part of my work as a comparative anatomist, a lot of what I do is very glamorous work which involves picking up roadkill um, <laughs> and taking the skin off it and hoping that it's not too smelly and looking at how the anatomy, particularly of the musculoskeletal system, is put together. And then in a paleontological context, trying to say, all right, if I understand the anatomy of these things that are living now, how can I then make functional interpretations about what things were like um, previously? So if we think about what functional anatomy is, it's basically, in my case, looking at the musculoskeletal system, trying to reflect um, how that arrangement of the musculoskeletal system relates to different behaviours, perhaps locomotion, perhaps feeding strategy, all of those sorts of things, and then trying to tease apart those sorts of relationships that we could then apply to fossils. Now, I'm also um, a little bit different. I guess most mammal people do a lot of craniodental stuff because it's much sexier if you've got something with teeth in it, particular things like thylakaleo that look really cool on slides. Um, I do a lot of postcranial work, which is nice in a way because nobody else really does it. So I certainly have a niche um, that allows me to look at some things and answer some interesting questions. So apologies for people that have seen me talk over the last 20 years. Alex, you've seen pictures of marsupial moles a long time ago. Um, but this is where I started kind of becoming involved in paleontology. So I did my PhD on marsupial moles with the late great Ken Applin. Um, and he kind of said, you know, lots of craniodental stuff gets done. Do some postcranial stuff and, and see what we can find. So I did uh, a PhD with a sample size of one and a half which for paleontologists isn't probably that bad, but usually it's kind of, you know, something that we would uh, be a little bit concerned about. And my questions were around how does the musculoskeletal system in these animals relate to the adaptations for digging, and then what can we apply if we can find some fossils? So I spent much time skinning and looking at tiny muscles and drawing pictures, because that's what I like doing, and then spent some time with Ken going through the Riversley collection looking and identifying some postcranial bones of marsupial moles, which, hooray, Robin um, very kindly got around to putting together with some of his other research, uh, and so now has finally been published, which is always very nice. And then sometime after that, I got an email from Alex, which was lovely, because I was at my wit's end at a job that I was at at, the, at that time, and he said, <coughs> Gavin Prido is coming to Wham. Um, and he's going to look at some fossil kangaroos. And would you like to come and do some work with him? And I said, hooray, yes, I'll write my resignation letter right now <laughs> and I'll be there tomorrow. So um, thank you, Alex, for, for having um, done that for me at that time. And so this was a time when uh, the Thylakaleo caves had been identified on the western end of the Malabar Plain. And Gavin at that time came, was coming back from the States, I think, to take up a, a fellowship position here to look at this work. And so within these um, caves, there are wonderful sort of, um, if you look from the surface of what's happening at this area, it looks like this. So there's, you know, not fabulous habitat there for lots of mammals. Uh, and underground, there's these magnificent caverns that I haven't been to, but people tell me. And within these magnificent caverns, there's incredible preservation of skeletons. And so these are animals that basically fell into a giant pit trap crawled off into a corner and became mummified. So we have these incredible associated skeletons that really are quite unusual. So for a lot of vertebrate paleontology, we get um, water deposits where stuff's been mixed around and ends up in a pile of stuff that you don't know what's associated with what, and it takes a long time to tease apart. Um, this provides the opportunity for us to actually associate a lot of elements that perhaps hadn't been recognised before and to really build some much more informed pictures of what these animals were like and what they were doing in that environment. So amongst the set of marsupials that came out of that cave, um, there was around 23 different species of kangaroos, at least eight of them uh, previously undescribed. And one of the most interesting stories are a number of tree kangaroos. Now, if you remember back to that photo of what the environment looks like now, there aren't any trees there. 
at all. So the fact that there are, in fact, two different species of tree kangaroos coming out of the caves, that came out of the caves deposits, is really very interesting. And so Gav and I, over the last 10 or probably 15 years, because time just keeps going by, have done a lot of work on fossil tree kangaroos. So um, these sit in the genus Bora, and Bora was originally described by Tim Flannery and Fred Zale in 82 from some very isolated uh, ankle bones from the Wellerton Caves. And there's also a few uh, ankle bones that have come out of some sites in Queensland as well. So we were able to build, we had almost two fairly complete skeletons from the Nullarbor Caves that were different species uh, to start building a picture of what the evolution of tree kangaroos actually looks like and how does that relate to the environment? Because we're looking at fossils from places place where there are no trees, um, but it, enables us to start building a picture, a clearer picture of what that environment may have been like. And so obviously it was very different not so long ago to how it is now. These fossils are less than a million years old. So there's been some fairly radical changes in the ecosystem structure if we've got these sorts of animals there. So we've done lots of bits and pieces on, on some tree kangaroos. And here's just a really beautiful articulated um, series of foot bones from Boronella Bora one of the new species. You can see by comparing the relative size and shapes of these different bones, here we've got a uh, macropus species, so a large grey kangaroo foot. Um, if we look at smaller wallabies, more diverse kind of generalist habitats, they have sort of broader bones. And then we look at a tree kangaroo foot, and we've got these very short, robust bones with very mobile articular surfaces that would relate to being able to manoeuvre feet around in a much more three-dimensionally interesting habitat than something that is set up for really efficient hopping over flat ground. So we're looking for these sorts of patterns. Something that's almost uh, ready, ready already? Everyone said that today. <laughs> it's a problem when you're used to standing up and lecturing for 45 minutes at a time, you just lose time. Okay, very quickly. Um, Another species from these caves is congruous now Kitcheneri. So um, we were hoping it was going to be something new, and I really wanted to call it congruous incongruous, um, <laughs> because congruous was named on some craniodental material and um, was you know it's just a, it's just a normal wallaby, so we'll say it's congruent. But in fact, the postcranial skeleton is completely incongruent with what we would expect a normal wallaby to be. Um, it has these ridiculously enormous hands. So here we've got the hand of a red kangaroo. The metatarsals are, sorry, the metacarpals are about the same length, but the digits are enormous with these enormous big curly claws on them. So here it looks like we've got another genus of kangaroos or wallabies that may well have been trying to climb trees because what else is a kangaroo going to use these things for? They had really big muscular limbs, all of those sorts of things. Very briefly, some other things that are happening in mammal paleontology world in WA. Kenny and I, uh, together with Aaron Caymans over at Flinders, have had fun putting together an atlas of a complete skeleton of a thylacine because we thought everybody needs one and not everybody <laughs> has access to the skeletons. So this will be out hopefully very soon in Paleontologica Electronica. Um, and my fabulous PhD and research students are trying to go from the sort of thing that I do, which is really very descriptive musculoskeletal anatomy, and make it into something that's more quantifiable, so they're collecting quantitative data and doing things like writing code in R, which I'm constantly in awe of. Um, so Meg, who's here today helping out, is looking at how the shapes of the different bones can be correlated with the actual quantitative development of muscles through the limb. And so if we can then apply that to fossils, we can actually look at the relative development of different muscles throughout the musculoskeletal system. So that's super cool work that's coming out. And I know this is not a mammal, but this is another super cool bit of work that an honor student of mine, Matt Patterson, did uh, last year. So sometimes if you're dissecting really tiny things, the muscles are really tiny and really hard to see. And so he's using a process of iodine staining and micro CT to then reconstruct what muscles might look like on um, very small living things that then we can apply to other things as well. So I will stop talking. Very good. Thank you.